Welcome to another lifelong nursing video. This one focuses on pulmonary CCRN review. I'm Brent, and let's get started. So for the pulmonary testable areas in the CCRN exam, there's acute lung injury, acute pulmonary embolism, acute respiratory failure, acute respiratory infections, air leak syndromes, aspiration, asthma, and status asthmaticus, COPD, failure to wean from the ventilator, pulmonary fibrosis, pulmonary hypertension, and thoracic surgery and trauma. Just for your information, the pulmonary portion includes 17% of the 80% of the clinical judgment portion of the CCRN exam. Under normal circumstances, our lungs ventilate and perfuse to provide our body with oxygenated blood and to get rid of the CO2 within our system. So for the ventilation portion, the air moves in and the air moves out, and in the smallest portion of the lung, the alveolar sac, this is where gas exchange occurs. The gas exchange is the perfusion portion of the ventilation and perfusion that the lungs do. The ventilation is just when air moves in and air moves out. Via the pulmonary artery, deoxygenated blood comes through the lungs and then goes through the small capillaries to allow diffusion to allow oxygen and CO2 to exchange at a cellular level. Once this happens, oxygenated blood continues via the pulmonary vein into the left atrium, into the left ventricle, and then the body. Perfusion is the transport of gases through the body, for example, the alveolar sac, which is perfused with blood circulation. Continuing, continuing on with anatomy and assessment, the primary muscle of ventilation is the diaphragm. The right lung has three lobes, and the left lung has two lobes. So how do we know that the patient is ventilating properly? This clinical indication of patient ventilation is the PaCO2 on the arterial blood gas, which the normal is 35 to 45. There's a thing called dead space ventilation where there's no gas exchange, and these are the areas of the pulmonary system, for example, the nose, the mouth, the trachea, and the bronchi. Remember, the only place where gas is exchanged is the alveolar sacs, unless there's altered circulation around that alveolar sac leading to no gas exchange. And for that, I'll show you an example. So again, here's the normal perfusion and ventilation of the alveolar sac. And once we have the altered circulation, such as a blood clot, that's going to interrupt the blood flow to the particular set of capillaries that passes through these alveolar sacs. So once the blood flow is interrupted, we're not going to have any more perfusion of these alveolar sacs, which does not allow CO2 and oxygen to exchange at a cellular level. This alveolar sac is now considered dead space ventilation like the trachea and bronchi where there's no gas exchange. Also, there's going to be no forward flow of blood related to that clot. So in continuation with the pulmonary embolism, some of the signs can be tachypnea, refractory hypoxemia, dyspnea, pleuritic chest pain, and some of the causes can be from air, blood, fat, or amniotic fluid, which puts more strain on the right ventricle as it tries to pump the same amount of blood through less of a circulatory system related to the clot. This leads to right ventricular heart failure. Some treatment for the pulmonary embolism is remembering our ABCs, airway, breathing, and circulation. We want to intubate the patient if necessary and administer 100% oxygen. We want to give thrombolytics if there is no contraindication and we can also do an embolectomy. We could place an IVC filter, which will not help the current pulmonary embolism, but will help reduce the ones that could happen in the future. And we also want to have pain management. A patient with increased pain uses up a lot of oxygen requirements, and therefore we want to manage their pain and decrease their anxiety. So moving on to the oxyhemoglobin disassociation curve, this indicates how your body will typically react when it goes through certain situations such as increase in pH or decrease in pH. So a shift to the left indicates an increase in pH that's going to be more on the alkalotic side. So when you have metabolic alkalosis or respiratory alkalosis, that means that your body is going to have a less affinity for CO2. Just because there's a shift to the left does not mean your temperature is going to go down. These are just indicators. This is just an indicator for, say for example, if your temperature goes down, if as you're hypothermic, that means your body's going to have a less affinity for oxygen, again, making you more cyanotic, and more than likely, increasing your pH. So shift to the right indicates a lower pH, for example, metabolic acidosis or respiratory acidosis. If you're in respiratory acidosis, your PaCO2 is going to be elevated, 
Your temperature necessarily doesn't have to be elevated, but if you're in a hyperthermic state, such as increased temperature, then often your pH will be acidic. Also, when there's a shift to the right on this curve, this is going to cause your hemoglobin to release oxygen more readily. So just to sum it up, this is not a graph you're looking at on a bedside monitor. This is just an association to what happens when your body becomes more acidic or less acidic or hyperthermic versus hypothermic. You're going to have these indicators on the left here to what is going to generally happen within your body. So you need to be thinking about that and how that's going to relate to what you're doing for the patient. This slide is just a summing up what I just said in the previous slide. So you're going to be more hypothermic with a shift to the left. You could also have low levels of 2,3 dBG, which plays a role in how much the affinity is for that oxygen on your hemoglobin molecule. And then, of course, the rest is what I summed up. I do want to point out some of the causes of decreased 2,3 dBG is multiple PRBC transfusions, hypothyroidism, and hypophosphatemia. So when you have a decreased 2,3-DPG, you may become more alkalotic. For example, multiple PRBC transfusions. And a shift to the right, again, making you more acidic from fever, high levels of 2,3-DPG, and again, respiratory or metabolic acidosis. Some of the causes of increased 2,3-DPG is anemia, chronic hypoxemia, and hyperthyroidism. So again, this DPG plays a large role in how much the hemoglobin molecule has an affinity for oxygen. Moving on to carbon monoxide poisoning, this is essentially the one of the easy questions on the test, and I've provided an example for you. A 50-year-old woman who lives at home with her husband was upstairs in her home while her husband went to the store. All of a sudden, she heard the fire alarm ringing throughout the house. She attempted to go downstairs to investigate. However, the fire was already spread through most of the downstairs. Risking her life, she escaped her home, but not before inhaling a lot of smoke and suffering carbon monoxide poisoning. Outside, the firefighters were already on scene setting up, and the woman began to immediately feel short of breath, dizziness, and she faints. At a cellular level, why does she experience these symptoms? The chemical identifier for carbon monoxide is CO, not CO2. So we have to think about this. This is going to be very similar to the CO2 which actually carbon monoxide is a cellular level, has a stronger affinity to these hemoglobin molecules, or vice versa, the hemoglobin molecule has a stronger affinity for the CO, the carbon monoxide, which will not allow carrying CO2 nor oxygen. And that means the more CO2 that's inhaled, the less CO2 and the less O2 that can be exchanged and utilized in those alveolar sacs. So the treatment for carbon monoxide poisoning is 100% oxygen administration, hyperbaric oxygen if possible, and to continue O2 administration until the carboxyhemoglobin level is less than 10%. And this is because when you've put somebody on the saturation monitor, the O2 saturation monitor, it's going to read a normal level. And that's because it's reading that carbon monoxide on that hemoglobin rather than oxygen. So you don't want to necessarily go by the oxygen level on the O2 sat. You want to administer 100% oxygen until that carboxyhemoglobin level is less than 10%. Moving on to arterial blood gases. This is great for a baseline assessment, respiratory assessment, acid-base balance, for, or monitoring for changes. Remember, what indicator on the ABG can depict how well the patient is ventilating and diffusion, otherwise known as gas exchange? Remember I mentioned back earlier, that was the PaCO2 level. So changes in the acid-base levels can occur quickly related to a respiratory cause and much slower due to a metabolic cause. So the normal values of an arterial blood gas is listed here. pH between 7.35 to 7.45, PaCO2 level of 35 to 45, a PaO2 level of 80 to 100, and a bicarb of 22 to 26 or 22 to 28, depending on your reference you're looking at. And the arterial oxygen saturation, 95 to 100%. And a normal base excess is plus or minus 2. If you do not want to refer to this video for the normal levels, I've made a helpful document that is available at lifelongnursing.com, and then you'll just click on the link, Helpful Documents. So let's talk about acid-based abnormalities. There are four basic ones that you will be expected to know. On this area of the test, many failed this concept, so be careful and double-check your answer. 
There's some points to remember. The pH level is essentially the measurement of the hydrogen ions in the blood. The CO2 is an acid, and the bicarb is a base. There are two ways to change the pH level, by the respiratory system or the metabolic system. So through the respiratory system, again, it's fast within minutes or within a couple of hours. And the metabolic system is more slow. This is hours to days. There are four primary acid-base imbalances. Respiratory acidosis, where your pH is less than 7.35, you can have an increase in PaCO2 and an increase in bicarb only by compensation in order to help bring that pH level back to normal. You can have metabolic acidosis. You can have a decrease in pH again, like respiratory acidosis. Only in this case, the bicarb is low, and then your PaCO2 is going to try to become lower only by compensation to bring that pH level down to normal. So remember that bicarb is your base, more alkalotic, and your PaO2 is an acid. So the more you get rid of your base, the more you're going to have to get rid of your acid to level out that pH. Respiratory alkalosis is the third. This is going to be an increase in pH greater than 7.45. And this is going to have primarily a decrease in pHCO2. And again, only by compensation to bring down the pH level, your bicarb is also going to try to come down, again, to match that acid, which will bring down your pH. The fourth is metabolic acidosis, which is, again, going to be increasing your pH greater than 7.45. And primarily, the bicarb is going to be increased. And again, only by compensation, the pH will hopefully return to normal by an increase in your PaCO2. Oftentimes, very early in the situations, these compensation methods are, have not taken effect yet. So you have to be aware of your patient's condition and you have to be able to distinguish acute versus chronic or early versus late when you're looking at acid-base imbalances on a CCRN exam. If you're confused, don't worry. We are going to go over quite a few arterial blood gas examples in this video. So moving on to anion gap and its role in acid base. The anion gap is very useful in monitoring metabolic acidosis without obtaining a lot of ABGs. So the formula for the anion gap is sodium plus potassium minus the sum of chloride plus bicarb. And this can be calculated using a simple BMP test, a basic metabolic panel. The normal range for an anion gap is 5 to 15. Again, there's going to be some slight variation based on reference, which could be 2 to 17, and that sort of nature. This is useful if the patient presents with severe metabolic acidosis with an anion gap of 26 and is started on treatment. Calculating the anion gap using the formula above off the basic metabolic panel can measure the response to that treatment. If the anion gap becomes lower, the treatment is working. If it's the same or higher, the treatment is not working. So that's why you're going to be drawing uh, daily BMPs or Q12 hour BMPs instead of drawing a bunch of arterial blood gases just to measure the treatment when you can do it off a simple venous blood test. You will not need to calculate the anion gap, just know that the concept and its usefulness, as well as conditions that increase that anion gap. Again, metabolic acidosis and worsening metabolic acidosis. So you can have ketoacidosis, uremia, which is increased to BUN level, salicylate intoxication, that's your aspirins, methanol ingestion, alcoholic ketosis, unmeasured osmols, as such as perihaldide and ethylene glycol, which can occur in poisoning, and your lactic acidosis, such as relation to hypoxemia and shock. So here we are. Let's practice these ABGs and get used to them so you'll nail them on the test. The first example, the pH is 7.26, so it's acidotic. You have a PaCO2 level of 63, that is greater than 45, so that again is acidotic. And then you have a bicarb level of 26, that is normal. So since that bicarb is normal, the PaCO2 is 63 and is acidotic. That matches your pH, which is acidotic. So this is going to be uncompensated. That pH is not returned to normal. And your bicarb is still normal. So what do you think the answer is? You can pause the video to write down your answer. And the answer is respiratory acidosis, which is uncompensated. All right, moving on to the next example, we have a pH of 
that is above 7.45, so that is alkalotic. We have a PaCO2 of 31, which is slightly under normal from the 35 to 45. So that again is a little on the alkalotic side. Remember that CO2 is an acid, but the less you have of it, the more alkalotic it is. Or essentially the less acidity it is, which makes it more alkalotic. So you have a bicarb level of 25, that is normal. So you have a pH that's alkalotic, a PaO2, that is alkalotic. What are we thinking of? Respiratory alkalosis, uncompensated. Again, it's uncompensated because that pH is not in within a normal level. The next example we have here is P we have a pH of 7.35, a PaCO2 level of 51, and a bicarb of 29. So as we're going over this, we have that pH level on the normal side, but it's on the low of normal side, which is the acidotic side. So it's uh, normal, but it's on the acidotic side. We have a PaCO2 level of 51, which is greater than the 45, which is going to be more acid. And then we have the bicarb level, which is a little out of range. It's 29. So that bicarb has increased to try and compensate for that CO2 and that pH level, and it looks like it's done its job because the pH level is normal. So the answer is respiratory acidosis compensated, or you can say compensated respiratory acidosis. Moving on to the next example, we have a pH of 7.29, a PaCO2 level of 35, and a bicarb that is 17. So we notice that the pH level is 7.29, and that is below 7.35. That is going to be on the acidotic side. If we look at our acid, our PaCO2, it's 35. That is on the low side of normal. So we're thinking we have the low, a little bit of low acid on the PaCO2. The normal is 35 to 45. And when we look at our bicarb, it's the alkalotic portion but we have less alkalosis from that bicarb, which in turn is gonna make that more acidic. So that can explain why that pH is 7.29. The acidity is coming from the bicarb level, not the PaCO2. So the answer to that is gonna be metabolic acidosis uncompensated. And again, that uncompensated portion relates to that pH level since it is not a normal pH. Moving on to the next example, we have a pH level of 7.45, a PaCO2 level of 47, and a bicarb of 30. Looking at that, the pH is normal. Our acid in this is the, CA, the PaCO2, which is 47, so we do have an increase just a little bit in the acid. And then in the bicarb, we have 30, again, which is just an increase in the alkalosis. So what we can say, since they're both increased, we've got to look at the pH and say which side of the pH is this on. So it's on the more alkalotic side, which is 7.45, and so what would cause more alkalosis? Not the increase in CO2, it's going to be the increase in bicarb. So that matches the pH, and that's going to be metabolic acid alkalosis compensated. And it's compensated again because that elevation of the CO2 and 7.45 on the pH, which is the normal level. Looking at the next example, 7.44 for the pH, PaCO2 level of 31, and a bicarb of 20. So we see that pH is a normal range. The PaCO2 is a little bit decreased, so that's less acid. And we have a bicarb that is a little less decreased, so that's less alkalosis. So we have to look at the pH. It's more on the alkalotic side, but it's normal. So this is compensated. So what could be causing this compensation, and what could be the condition? So the condition is respiratory alkalosis, which is compensated, and that compensation comes from the bicarb. The next one is a pH of 7.36 with a PaCO2 level of 44 and a bicarb of 26. pH is normal, but on the acidic side. The PaCO2 level is 44, which is normal. It's between 35 and 45. And the bicarb is 26. That is also normal, but it's on the high side of normal. So what do we have here? We have 
normal ABG. All the values are normal, then we're going to have a normal ABG. Curveball. So moving on to lung compliance. Lung compliance is an important concept to understand on the CCRN exam. Lung compliance is how well the lungs accept the positive pressure ventilation, such as CPAP, BiPAP, or the ventilator. In other words, are the lungs elastic or are they stiff? We want elastic lungs because that's how they relax and take in the breath, which will allow the most efficient gas exchange. So lung compliance is measured in two types, static compliance and dynamic compliance. Static compliance measures the elasticity of the tissues in the lung, which can be calculated by the tidal volume divided by the plateau pressure minus P. And this level should be between 45 and 50 centimeters of water. Dynamic compliance measures the elasticity of the tissues of the airways, not the lung. So this is the tidal volume divided by peak pressure minus PEEP. And that, again, that level should, between, should be between 45 and 50 centimeters of water. So why is this important to understand? Well, patients with lung problems that involve the lung and not the airways, such as pneumonia or ARDS, can have a decrease in static compliance and potentially dynamic compliance depending on the severity of the disease. Patients with lung problems that, that involve only the airways and not the lungs, such as asthma or status asthmaticus, will have a decrease in dynamic compliance However, the static compliance will remain the same. You do need to know that decreased lung compliance, static or dynamic, will increase the patient's work of breathing. So let's go into the types of respiratory failure. This is just a broad generalization, but you can have, number one, hypoxemic respiratory failure, which is when a PaCO2 level is less than 60 on the ABG. This can be from ARDS, asthma, atelectasis, pneumonia, pulmonary edema, pulmonary embolism, and interstitial fibrosis. Again, those are not limited, that's just some examples. There could be many other conditions causing hypoxemia. Some of the signs of hypoxemic respiratory failure is tachypnea, accessory muscle use, tachyarrhythmias, bradyarrhythmias, hypertension or hypotension, cyanosis, anxiety and agitation. You can also have a second type of respiratory failure, and that is hypercapnic respiratory failure. And these are a lot of your COPD people who retain CO2. So this is hypercapnic when your CO2 is greater than 50. In addition to COPD, this can be from the central nervous system depression due to drugs or alcohol, an increase in intracranial pressures, again, COPD, asthma, ALS, multiple sclerosis, myasthenia gravis, and flow chest. So the last four is from essentially not being able to breathe deep enough based on either mu muscle weakness or um, failure of the diaphragm or trauma. So some of the signs of hypercapnic respiratory failure include shallow breathing, breathing too slow, and a progressive decreased level of consciousness. And then there's the combined types of respiratory failure. This is going to be hypoxemic and hypercapnic when you have severe ARDS or asthma and COPD. So some of the treatments for respiratory failure include maintaining the patient's airway. We want to position them upright, use bronchodilators, suction them, use non-invasive ventilation, mechanical ventilation, and serial arterial blood gases to monitor. You want to use non-invasive ventilation if you think that you, you may resolve this respiratory failure within a short amount of time, and mechanical invasive ventilation when you don't expect the patient to make a quick recovery. You want to improve oxygenation by adjusting the oxygen to maintain 90% or greater on the SAO2. Do not allow oxygen toxicity. Therefore, decrease or lessen the FiO2 when possible. You can use also CPAP or BiPAP as necessary, such as non-invasive ventilation, and maintain adequate circulation. You want to correct hypotension and any cardiac arrhythmias. So let's go into types of ventilation. As mentioned before, we want to monitor the patient's ventilation and airway, and this some of the indicators that they're not being adequately ventilated is the decrease in PaCO2 or an increase in PaCO2. You can also have a decreased level of consciousness with respiratory compromise and failure of the pulmonary system to adequately ventilate or oxygenate the tissues, which again is respiratory failure. 
Mechanical ventilation is typically referred to as invasive mechanical ventilation via ET tube or via intubation with the ventilator. But it also can be non-invasive ventilation such as CPAP or BiPAP because they're used on that machine to help and support them breathe. Non-invasive ventilation, CPAP, is your continuous positive airway pressure. This includes FiO2, which is your fraction of an inspiration of oxygen, and one pressure setting. This is useful for patients who have increased work of breathing and increases ventilation for these patients. Your second type of non-invasive ventilation is BiPAP. This is bi-level positive airway pressure. This includes FiO2 and two pressure settings, inspiration and expiration. This increases both ventilation and oxygenation. This is useful for patients who are hypoxemic and or in hypercapnic respiratory failure and are expected to make a fast recovery. Some of the advantages of non-invasive ventilation includes reduces the work of breathing because anyone that has a decrease in lung compliance increases their work of breathing. Non-invasive ventilation can also be applied quickly, improves oxygenation and ventilation, decreases preload and afterload in the circulatory system, and helps to reduce atelectasis in the lungs. We want to increase and recruit the amount of alveolar sacs which help that gas exchange. So some of the contraindications for the non-invasive ventilations is a copious amount of secretions, which will not be good because we don't want to use that invasive, that non-invasive ventilation to push those secretions possibly back into the airway or into the stomach. You also don't want to use this for patients at a high risk for aspiration, suspected pneumothorax, combative or agitated patient, a patient with impaired mental status, and life-threatening hypoxemia with FiO2 of 100%. So this is essentially saying don't use it if they can't protect their airway and if you've suspected pneumothorax or if the patient's fighting you and if the patient is not responding to ventilation even if the oxygen is on 100%. This is an indication for invasive mechanical ventilation and this requires placement of an endotracheal tube or tracheostomy tube. With these tubes in place, confirmation of placement is used immediately. We're going to use waveform capnography and tidal CO2, or auscultation of the lung sounds. The waveform capnography should equal the CO2 levels of a normal CO2 level, 35-45. If you're getting waveform capnography that's around 10, then the endotracheal tube or tracheostomy tube is not positioned correctly. The chest x-ray should double confirm the tip of the endotracheal tube should be 2 or 3 to 5 centimeters above the crina, and the most common malposition of the endotracheal tube is within the right lung, therefore not ventilating the left lung. The ventilator, there's two basic concepts. It delivers a set tidal volume, or it delivers a set pressure. Not both. You either want to do one or number two, depending on the patient's condition. Mechanical ventilation invasive provides three primary modes. There are more than three primary modes, but this is the three primary modes that are going to be on the CCRN exam, so that's why we will go for just these three. There's a cyst control mode, which always deliver a set volume, called tidal volume, at a set respiratory rate. For example, if the tidal volume is set at 500, even if the patient breathes over the ventilator, meaning if they take a breath on their own, the ventilator will still give a 500 ml set tidal volume. Some of the disadvantages of assist control mode is can result in overventilation or hyperinflation of the lungs if the patient is spontaneously breathing and also increases peak pressures, which increases your risk of barotrauma in the patient. This setting you will not give a patient who is alert and awake, setting that you want to have them on super sedated or unconscious or in a medical induced coma. That way, there's no risk of breathing over the ventilator, there's no risk of overventilation or hyperinflation of the lungs. The number two primary mode is pressure control assist control mode. This, this always delivers a set pressure, not volume, which is often referred to as pressure above PEEP. And this you can also set at a set respiratory rate. For example, if the pressure is set at 30 above PEEP, even if the patient breathes over the ventilator, meaning if they take a breath on their own, the ventilator will still give the set pressure of 30. 
There are some advantages to this. You can control your peak pressures, which will reduce the risk of hyperinflation and for those with decreased lung compliance. So those patients with uh, pulmonary fibrosis or restri other restrictive lung diseases, they can do better on a pressure control mode. Some of the disadvantages are the vol tidal volumes are not guaranteed and therefore will alarm if the patient has a high variation in tidal volume because that ventilator is focusing on that pressure, not the tidal volume. So the last primary mode we need to go over for the CCRN exam is the synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation, which is SIMV. This setting always delivers a set tidal volume and a set respiratory rate. Again, the set respiratory rate can be an option. Similar to assist control in that a set volume and set respiratory rate is delivered, however, when the patient breathes over the ventilator, they do not receive the set tidal volume like in assist control. The patient only breathes in their own tidal volume, not that the ventilator gives. So each breath given by the ventilator is synchronized with the patient's on the respiratory rate and can be supported by pressure support, which I'll go over in the next slide. This mode of the ventilator is good for ventilator weaning as the set respiratory rate is turned down. The patient is required to work harder for each breath essentially strengthening their lungs over time. In addition to three primary modes, there are three ventilator settings that are on the CCRN exam. Again, there are more settings than these three, but these are the ones you need to know. So number one, fraction of inspired oxygen, that is the FiO2. This essentially is the amount of oxygen for the ventilator supplying to the patient. And understand that oxygen is actually bad for the lungs in high levels. Any amount of FiO2 above 50% hurts the lungs over time and can lead to oxygen toxicity at 100%. All of the modes and settings can be turned off, leaving only the patient to breathe oxygen via the ET tube or tracheostomy with no support at all. There's a second setting on the ventilator, PEEP, which is positive end expiratory pressure. This setting on the ventilator is the lowest setting on the ventilator that supports the patient and is delivered throughout both inspiration and expiration, which is most importantly at the end of expiration where alveolar collapse would normally happen. This PEEP keeps the alveolar open, allowing for more gas exchange, as I've mentioned before. And the third setting that you need to know on the CCRN is the pressure support ventilation mode. This setting on the ventilator will provide the patient with an increased airway pressure upon inspiration that is higher than the PEEP setting. This gives the patient a boost in tidal volumes and is used with ventilator weaning. The higher the number, the higher support. Moving on to some facts about mechanical ventilation. Setting the tidal volume for the patient is determined by the patient's ideal body weight, not their current weight. So in general, we're going to use an average between 6 to 10 ml per kilogram of the patient's ideal body weight. Patients with severe lung disease, such as ARDS or pulmonary fibrosis, we're going to decrease that number we use to like 4 to 6 milliliters per kilogram. So let's go over an example. What we would want the tidal volume to be set at in a patient with a current weight of 108 kilograms. Well, there's a trick to that because remember, we're not going about the current weight. We're going to use ideal body weight. So we need to know their height, their weight, and do, and do a little bit of a calculation. So we have a patient that is 5'7 and 87 kilograms. Her ideal body weight is calculated by 45.5 kilograms plus 2.3 kilograms for each inch over 5 feet. So since she's 5'7, we're going to add... 45 plus the result of 7 times 2.3 because 7 is that number of 7 inches over 5 feet. So this equals 61.6 kilograms. So using the 8 milliliter per kilogram reference, we want to set the tidal volume approximately 492 milliliters or we can round to 490 milliliters tidal volume. Were you confused? We'll go over it one more time. Again, how do we set tidal volume? We want to use the reference range 6 to 10 ml per kilogram for the patient's ideal body weight. Ideal body weight for men is 50 kilograms plus 2.3 kilograms for each inch over 5 feet. Ideal body weight for women is 45.5 kilograms and plus 2.3 kilograms for each inch over 5 feet. If we have a woman patient at 5'7", like in this example, we calculated in her ideal body weight would be 45.5 kilograms 
plus 7 times 2.3, for again 7 inches above 5 feet. This comes to 45.5 kilograms plus 16.1 kilograms for every inch above 5 feet, and then that equals 61.6 kilograms ideal body weight for this patient who is a woman. The tidal volume is 8 times 61 because we're using the 8 milliliters for just an average for tidal volume. And that's going to equal out 42.8 mLs or 42, which you can again round down to 490 tidal volume on, to be used on the ventilator. You can certainly set the tidal volume on the ventilator to be 492, but it's just in general easier to keep up with if it's on a nice rounded out number. Here's some more fast facts about mechanical ventilation. There are high pressure alarms and low pressure alarms. Some of the examples of high pressure alarms are pneumothorax, coughing, a lot of secretions in the airway, patient's agitation, kinked ET tubing, bronchospasm, mucosal edema, and decreased lung compliance such as ARDS or like pulmonary fibrosis. Low pressure alarms can be the result of inadequate tidal volume, a cuff leak, a chest tube leak, and a ventilator circuit that has a leak or a disconnection. As always, if you cannot troubleshoot the ventilator alarm, remove the patient from the ventilator and use a bag valve device, such as the Ambu bag, to ventilate the patient and remember to connect the oxygen to that Ambu bag. That's the end of this video. Thanks for watching part one. Be sure to watch the second part of the pulmonary concept for the CCRN examination where I'll go over respiratory diseases and treatments. As always, please subscribe and visit lifelongnursing.com for more great and free content. Remember, learn everything. Thank you.